part one of the fringes of the fleet by rudyard kipling this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the fringes of the fleet by rudyard kipling part one the auxiliaries chapters one and two in Lowestoff a boat was laid, mark well what I do say, and she was built for the herring trade, but she has gone a rovin', a rovin', a rovin', the Lord knows where. They gave her government coal to burn, and a QF gun at bow and stern, and sent her out a rovin', a rovin', a rovin', the Lord knows where. Her skipper was mate of a buco ship, which always killed one man per trip, so he is used to rovin', a rovin', a rovin', the Lord knows where. Her mate was skipper of a chapel in Wales, and so he fights in topper and tails. Religious, though rovin', a rovin', a rovin', the Lord knows where. Her engineer is fifty-eight, so he's prepared to meet his fate, which ain't unlikely rovin', a rovin', a rovin', the Lord knows where her leading stoker's seventeen so he don't know what the judgments mean unless he cops em a rovin a rovin a rovin the lord knows where her cook was chef in the lost dog's home mark well what i do say and i'm sorry for fritz when they all come a rovin a rovin a roarin and a rovin round the north sea rovin the lord knows where chapter one the navy is very old and very wise much of her wisdom is on record and available for reference but more of it works in the unconscious blood of those who serve her she has a thousand years of experience and can find precedent or parallel for any situation that the force of the weather or the malice of the king's enemies may bring about the main principles of sea warfare hold good throughout all ages and so far as the navy has been allowed to put out her strength these principles have been applied over all the seas of the world for matters of detail the navy to whom all days are alike has simply returned to the practice and resurrected the spirit of old days in the late french wars a merchant sailing out of a channel port might in a few hours find himself laid by the heels and under way for a french prison his majesty's ships of the line and even the big frigates took little part in policing the waters for him unless he were in convoy the sloops cutters gun brigs and local craft of all kinds were supposed to look after that while the line was busy elsewhere so the merchants passed resolutions against the inadequate protection afforded to the trade and the narrow seas were full of single ship actions mail packets west country brigs and fat east india men fighting for their own hulls and cargo anything that the watchful french ports sent against them the sloops and cutters bearing a hand if they happened to be within reach the oldest navy it was a brutal age ministered to by hard-fisted men and we had put it a hundred decent years behind us when it all comes back again to-day there are no prisons for the crews of merchantmen but they can go to the bottom by mine and torpedo even more quickly than their ancestors were run into la havre the submarine takes the place of the privateer the line as in the old wars is occupied bombarding and blockading elsewhere but the seaborne traffic must continue and that is being looked after by the lineal descendants of the crews of the long extinct cutters and sloops and gun brigs the hour struck and they reappeared to the tune of fifty thousand odd men in more than two thousand ships of which i have seen a few hundred words of command may have changed a little the tools are certainly more complex but the spirit of the new crews who come to the old job is utterly unchanged it is the same fierce hard-living heavy-handed very cunning service out of which the navy as we know it to-day was born it is called indifferently the trawler and auxiliary fleet it is chiefly composed of fishermen but it takes in every one who may have maritime tastes from retired admirals to the son of the sea-cook 
it exists for the benefit of the traffic and the annoyance of the enemy its doings are recorded by flags stuck into charts its casualties are buried in obscure corners of the newspapers the grand fleet knows it slightly the restless light cruisers who chaperone it from the background are more intimate the destroyers working off unlighted coasts over unmarked shoals come as you might say in direct contact with it the submarine alternately praises and since one periscope is very like another curses its activities but the steady procession of traffic in home waters liner and tramp six every sixty minutes blesses it altogether since this most christian war includes laying mines in the fairways of traffic and since these mines may be laid at any time by german submarines especially built for the work or by neutral ships all fairways must be swept continuously day and night when a nest of mines is reported traffic must be hung up or deviated till it is cleared out when traffic comes up channel it must be examined for contraband and other things and the examining tugs lie out in a blaze of lights to remind ships of this months ago when the war was young the tugs did not know what to look for specially now they do all this mine searching and reporting and sweeping plus the direction and examination of the traffic plus the laying of our own ever-shifting minefields is part of the trawler fleet's work because the navy as we knew it is busy elsewhere and there is always the enemy submarine with the price on her head whom the trawler fleet hunts and traps with zeal and joy add to this that there are boats fishing for real fish to be protected in their work at sea or chased off dangerous areas where because they are strictly forbidden to go they naturally repair and you will begin to get some idea of what the trawler and auxiliary fleet does the ships and the men now imagine the acreage of several dock basins crammed gunwale to gunwale with brown and umber and ochre and rust-red steam trawlers tugs harbour boats and yachts once clean and respectable now dirty and happy throw in fish steamers surprise packets of unknown lines and indescribable junks sampans lorchas catamarans and general service stink pontoons filled with indescribable apparatus manned by men no dozen of whom seem to talk the same dialect or wear the same clothes the mustard-coloured jersey who is cleaning a six-pounder on a hull boat clips his words between his teeth and would be happier in gaelic the whitish singlet and grey trousers held up by what is obviously his soldier brother's spare regimental belt is pure lowestoft the complete blue serge and soot suit passed a wire down a hatch in glasgow as far as you can hear him which is a fair distance because he wants something done to the other end of the wire and the flat-faced boy who should be attending to it hails from the remoter hebrides and is looking at a girl on the dock edge the bow-legged man in the ulster and green-worsted comforter is a warm grimsby skipper worth several thousands he and his crew who are mostly his own relations keep themselves to themselves and save their money the pirate with the red beard barking over the rail at a friend with gold earrings comes from sky the friend is west country the noticeably insignificant man with the soft and deprecating eye is skipper and part owner of the big slashing iceland trawler on which he droops like a flower she is built to almost western ocean lines carries a little boat deck aft with tremendous stanchions has a nose cocked high against ice and sweeping seas and resembles a hawk moth at rest the small sniffing man is reported to be a holy terror at sea hunters and fishers the child in the pullman car uniform just going ashore is a wireless operator aged nineteen he is attached to a flagship at least a hundred and twenty feet long under an admiral aged twenty-five who was till the other day third mate of a north atlantic tramp but who now leads a squadron of six trawlers to hunt submarines the principle is simple enough its application depends on circumstances and surroundings 
one class of german submarines meant for murder off the coasts may use a winding and rabbit-like track between shoals where the choice of water is limited their career is rarely long but while it lasts moderately exciting others told off for deep-sea assassinations are attended to quite quietly and without any excitement at all others again work the inside of the north sea making no distinction between neutrals and allied ships these carry guns and since their work keeps them a good deal on the surface the trawler fleet as we know engages them there the submarine firing sinking and rising again in unexpected quarters the trawler firing dodging and trying to ram the trawlers are strongly built and can stand a great deal of punishment yet again other german submarines hang about the skirts of fishing fleets and fire into the brown of them when the war was young this gave splendidly frightful results but for some reason or other the game is not as popular as it used to be lastly there are german submarines who perish by ways so curious and inexplicable that one could almost credit the whispered idea it must come from the scotch skippers that the ghosts of the women drowned pilot them to destruction but what form these shadows take whether of the lusitania ladies or humbler stewardesses and hospital nurses and what lights or sounds the thing fancies it sees or hears before it is blotted out no man will ever know the main fact is that the work is being done whether it was necessary or politic to reawaken by violence every sporting instinct of a sea-going people is a question which the enemy may have to consider later on dawn off the foreland the young flood making jumbled and short and steep black in the hollows and bright where it's breaking awkward water to sweep mines reported in the fairway warn all traffic and detain sent up unity clarabel assyrian stormcock and golden game noon off the foreland the first ebb making lumpy and strong in the bite boom after boom and golf hut shaking and the jackdaws wild with fright mines located in the fairway boats now working up the chain sweepers unity clarabel assyrian stormcock and golden gain dusk off the foreland the last light going and the traffic crowding through and five damned trawlers with their sirens blowing heading the whole review sweep completed in the fairway no more mines remain sent back unity clarabel assyrian stormcock and golden game chapter two the trawlers seem to look on mines as more or less fair play but with the torpedo it is otherwise a yarmouth man lay on his hatch his gear neatly stowed away below and told me that another yarmouth boat had gone up with all hands except one twas a submarine not a mine said he they never gave our boys no chance yeah she was a yarmouth boat we knew em all they never gave the boys no chance he was a submarine hunter and he illustrated by means of matches placed at various angles how the blindfold business is conducted and then he ended there's always what he'll do you've got to think that out for yourself while you're working above him same as if twas fish i should not care to be hunted for the life in shallow waters by a man who knows every bank and pothole of them even if i had not killed his friends the week before being nearly all fishermen they discuss their work in terms of fish and put in their leisure fishing overside when they sometimes pull up ghastly souvenirs but they all want guns those who have three pounders clamour for sixes sixes for twelves and the twelve-pound aristocracy dream of four inchers on anti-aircraft mountings for the benefit of roving zeppelins they will all get them in time and i fancy it will be long ere they give them up one west country mate announced that a gun is a handy thing to have aboard always but in peacetime i said wouldn't it be in the way 
when used to em now was the smiling answer never go to sea again without a gun i wouldn't if i had my way keeps all hands pleased like they talk about men in the army who will never willingly go back to civil life what of the fishermen who have tasted something sharper than salt water and what of the young third and fourth mates who have held independent commands for nine months past one of them said to me quite irrelevantly i used to be the animal that got up the trunks for the women on baggage days in the old bodium castle and he mimicked their requests for the large brown box or the black dress basket as a freed soul might scoff at his old life in the flesh a common sweeper my sponsor and chaperone in this elizabethan world of eighteenth-century seamen was an a b who had gone down in the land rail assisted at the heligoland fight seen the blucher sink and the bombs dropped on our boats when we tried to save the drowning whereby as he said those germans died got strafin their own country because we didn't wait to be strafed and has now found more peaceful days in an office ashore he led me across many decks from craft to craft to study the various appliances that they specialize in almost our last was what a north country trawler called a common sweeper that is to say a mine sweeper she was at tea in her shirt sleeves and she protested loudly that there was nothing in sweeping see that wire rope she said well it leads through that lead to the ship which you're sweeping with she makes her end fast and you make yours then you sweep together at whichever depth you've agreed upon between you by means of that arrangement there which regulates the depth they give you a glass sort of thing for keeping your distance from the other ship but that's not wanted if you know each other well then you sweep as the saying is there's nothing in it you sweep till this wire rope fouls the bloomin' mines. Then you go on till they appear on the surface, so to say, and then you explode em by means of shootin' at em with that rifle in the gallery there. There's nothin' in sweepin' more than that. And if you hit a mine, I asked, well, you go up, but you hadn't ought to hit em if you're careful. The thing is to get hold of the first mine all right, and then you go on to the next, and so on, in a way of speakin'. "'And you can fish, too, tween times,' said a voice from the next boat. A man leaned over and returned a borrowed mug. They talked about fishing, notably that once they caught some red mullet, which the common sweeper and his neighbor had both agreed were not natural in these waters. As for mere sweeping, it bored them profoundly to talk about it i only learned later as part of the natural history of mines that if you rake the trinitrotoluol by hand out of a german mine you develop eruptions and skin poisoning but on the authority of two experts there is nothing in sweeping nothing whatever a block in the traffic now imagine not a pistol shot from these crowded keys a little office hung round with charts that are pencilled and noted over various shoals and soundings there is a movable list of the boats at work with quaint and domestic names outside the window lies the packed harbour outside that again the line of traffic up and down a stately cinema show of six ships to the hour for the moment the film sticks a boat probably a common sweeper reports an obstruction in the traffic lane a few miles away she has found and exploded one mine the office heard the dull boom of it before the wireless report came in in all likelihood there is a nest of them there it is possible that a submarine may have got in last night between certain shoals and laid them out the shoals are being shepherded in case she is hidden anywhere but the boundaries of the newly discovered mine area must be fixed and the traffic deviated there is a tramp outside with tugs in attendance she has hit something and is leaking badly where shall she go the office gives her her destination the harbour is too full for her to settle down here she swings off between the faithful tugs down coast someone asks by wireless if they shall hold up their traffic it is exactly like a signaller offering a train to the next block yes the office replies wait a while 
if it's what we think there will be a little delay if it isn't what we think there will be a little longer delay meantime sweepers are nosing round the suspected area looking for cuckoo's eggs as a voice suggests and a patrol boat lathers her way down coast to catch and stop anything that may be on the move for skippers are sometimes rather careless words begin to drop out of the air into the chart hung office six and a half cable south fifteen east of something or other mark it well and tell them to work up from there is the order another mine exploded yes and we heard that too says the office what about the submarine elizabeth huggins reports elizabeth's scandal must be fairly high flavoured for a torpedo boat of immoral aspects slings herself out of harbour and hastens to share it if elizabeth has not spoken the truth there may be words between the parties for the present a pencilled suggestion seems to cover the case together with a demand as far as one can make out for more common sweepers they will be forthcoming very shortly those at work have got the run of the mines now and are busily hawking them up a trawler skipper wishes to speak to the office they have ordered him out but his boiler most of it is on the quay at the present time and you'll remember it's the same with my foremast and port riggin sir the office does not precisely remember but if boiler and foremast are on the quay the rest of the ship had better stay alongside the skipper falls away relieved he scraped a tramp a few nights ago in a bit of a sea there is a little mutter of gunfire somewhere across the grey water where a fleet is at work a monitor as broad as she is long comes back from wherever the trouble is slips through the harbour mouth all wreathed with signals is received by two motherly lighters and to all appearance goes to sleep between them the office does not even look up for that is not in their department they have found a trawler to replace the boilerless one her name is slid into the rack the immoral torpedo boat flounces back to her moorings evidently what elizabeth huggins said was not evidence the messages and replies begin again as the day closes the night patrol return now to the inner harbour at twilight there was a stir among the packed craft like the separation of dried tea leaves in water the swing bridge across the basin shut against us a boat shot out of the jam took the narrow exit at a fair seven knots and rounded into the outer harbour with all the pomp of a flagship which was exactly what she was others followed breaking away from every quarter in silence boat after boat fell into line gear stowed away spars and buoys in order on their clean decks guns cast loose and ready wheelhouse windows darkened and everything in order for a day or a week or a month out there was no word anywhere the interrupted foot traffic stared at them as they slid past below a woman beside me waved a hand to a man on one of them and i saw his face light as he waved back the boat where they had demonstrated for me with matches was the last her skipper hadn't thought it worth while to tell me that he was going that evening then the line straightened up and stood out to sea you never said this was going to happen i said reproachfully to my a b no more i did said he it's the night patrol going out fact is i'm so used to the bloomin evolution that it never struck me to mention it as you might say next morning i was at service in a man-of-war and even as we came to the prayer that the navy might be a safeguard to such as pass upon the sea on their lawful occasions i saw the long procession of traffic resuming up and down the channel six ships to the hour it has been hung up for a bit they said End of part one part two of the fringes of the fleet by rudyard kipling this librivox recording is in the public domain part two submarines chapters one and two
farewell and adieu to you greenwich ladies farewell and adieu to you ladies ashore for we've received orders to work to the eastward where we hope in a short time to strafe em some more we'll duck and we'll dive like little tin turtles we'll duck and we'll dive underneath the north seas until we strike something that doesn't expect us from here to cuxhaven it's go as you please the first thing we did was to dock in a minefield which isn't a place where repairs should be done and there we lay doggo in twelve fathom water with trinitro toluol hogging our run the next thing we did we rose under a zeppelin with his shiny big belly half blocking the sky but what in the heavens can you do with six pounders so we fired what we had and we bade em good-bye chapter one the chief business of the trawler fleet is to attend to the traffic the submarine in her sphere attends to the enemy like the destroyer the submarine has created its own type of officer and man with a language and traditions apart from the rest of the service and yet at heart unchangingly of the service their business is to run monstrous risks from earth air and water in what to be of any use must be the coldest of cold blood the commander's is more a one-man job as the crew's is more teamwork than any other employment afloat that is why the relations between submarine officers and men are what they are they play hourly for each other's lives with death the umpire always at their elbow on tiptoe to give them out there is a stretch of water once dear to amateur yachtsmen now given over to scouts submarines destroyers and of course contingents of trawlers we were waiting the return of some boats which were due to report a couple surged up the still harbour in the afternoon light and tied up beside their sisters there climbed out of them three or four high-booted sunken-eyed pirates clad in sweaters under jackets that a stoker of the last generation would have disowned this was their first chance to compare notes at close hand together they lamented the loss of a zeppelin a perfect mug of a zepp who had come down very low and offered one of them a sitting shot but what can you do with our guns i gave him what i had and then he started bombing i know he did another said i heard him that's what brought me down to you i thought he had you that last time no i was forty foot under when he hove out of the big un what happened to you my steering gear jammed just after i went down and i had to go round in circles till i got it straightened out but wasn't he a mug was he the brute with the patch on his port side a sister boat demanded no this fellow had just been hatched he was almost sitting on the water heaving bombs over and my blasted steering gear went and chose then to go wrong the other commander mourned i thought his last little egg was going to get me half an hour later i was formally introduced to three or four quite strange quite immaculate officers freshly shaved and a little tired about the eyes whom i thought i had met before labour and refreshment meantime it was on the hour of evening drinks one of the boats was still unaccounted for no one talked of her they rather discussed motor-cars and admiralty constructors but it felt like that queer twilight watch at the front when the homing aeroplanes drop in presently a signaller entered v forty two outside sir wants to know which channel she shall use oh thank you tell her to take so and so mine i remember was vermouth and bitters and later on v forty two himself found a soft chair and joined the committee of instruction those next for duty as well as those in training wished to hear what was going on and who had shifted what to where and how certain arrangements had worked they were told in language not to be found in any printable book questions and answers were alike hebrew to one listener but he gathered that every boat carried a second in command a strong persevering youth who seemed responsible for everything that went wrong from a motor cylinder to a torpedo 
then somebody touched on the mercantile marine and its habits said one philosopher they can't be expected to take any more risks than they do i wouldn't if i was a skipper i'd loose off at any blessed periscope i saw well, that's all very fine you wait till you've had a patriotic tramp trying to strafe you at your own back door said another some one told a tale of a man with a voice notable even in a service where men are not trained to whisper he was coming back empty-handed dirty tired and best left alone for the peace of the german side he had entered our hectic home waters where the usual tramp shelled and by miraculous luck crumpled his periscope another man might have dived but boanerges kept on rising majestic and wrathful he rose personally through his main hatch and at two thousand yards have i said it was a still day addressed the tramp even at that distance she gathered it was a naval officer with a grievance and by the time he ran alongside she was in a state of coma but managed to stammer well sir at least you'll admit that our shooting was pretty good and that said my informant put the lid on boanerges went down lest he should be tempted to murder and the tramp affirmed she heard him rumbling beneath her like an inverted thunderstorm for fifteen minutes all those tramps ought to be disarmed and we ought to have all their guns said a voice out of a corner what still worrying over your mug some one replied he was a mug went on the man of one idea if i'd had a couple of twelves even i could have strafed him proper i don't know whether i shall mutiny or desert or write to the first sea lord about it strafe all admiralty constructors to begin with i could build a better boat with a four-inch lathe and a sardine tin than the speaker named her by letter and number that's pure jealousy her commander explained to the company ever since i installed ahem, my patent electric wash basin he's been intriguing to get her why we know he doesn't wash he'd only use the basin to keep beer in underwater works however often one meets it as in this war one meets it at every turn one never gets used to the holy spirit of man at his job the common sweeper growling over his mug of tea that there was nothing in sweepin and these idly chaffing men new shaved and attired from the gates of death which had let them through for the fiftieth time were all of the same fabric incomprehensible i should imagine to the enemy and the stuff held good throughout all the world from the dardanelles to the baltic where only a little while ago another batch of submarines had slipped in and begun to be busy i had spent some of the afternoon in looking through reports of submarine work in the sea of marmora they read like the diary of energetic weasels in an overcrowded chicken run and the results for each boat were tabulated something like a cricket score there were no maiden overs one came across jewels of price set in the flat official phraseology for example one man who was describing some steps he was taking to remedy certain defects interjected casually at this point i had to go under for a little as a man in a boat was trying to grab my periscope with his hand no reference before or after to the said man or his fate again came across a dhow with a turkish skipper he seemed so miserable that i let him go and elsewhere in those waters a submarine overhauled a steamer full of turkish passengers some of whom arguing on their allies lines promptly leaped overboard our boat fished them out and returned them for she was not killing civilians in another affair which included several ships now at the bottom and one submarine the commander relaxes enough to note that the men behaved very well under direct and flanking fire from rifles at about fifteen yards this was not i believe the submarine that fought the turkish cavalry on the beach and in addition to matters much more marvellous than any i have hinted at the reports deal with repairs and shifts and contrivances carried through in the face of dangers that read like the last delirium of romance one boat went down the straits and found herself rather canted over to one side 
a mine and chain had jammed under her forward diving plane so far as i made out she shook it off by standing on her head and jerking backward or it may have been for the thing has occurred more than once she merely rose as much as she could when she could and then released it by hand as the official phrase goes four nightmares and who a few months ago could have invented or having invented could have dared to print such a nightmare as this there was a boat in the north sea who ran into a net and was caught by the nose she rose still entangled meaning to cut the thing away on the surface but a zeppelin in waiting saw and bombed her and she had to go down again at once but not too wildly or she would get herself more wrapped up than ever she went down and by slow working and weaving and wriggling guided only by guesses at the meaning of each scrape and grind of the net on her blind forehead at last she drew clear then she sat on the bottom and thought the question was whether she should go back at once and warn her confederates against the trap or wait till the destroyers which she knew the zeppelin would have signalled for should come out to finish her still entangled as they would suppose in the net it was a simple calculation of comparative speeds and positions and when it was worked out she decided to try for the double event within a few minutes of the time she had allowed for them she heard the twitter of four destroyer screws quartering above her rose got her shot in saw one destroyer crumple hung round till another took the wreck in tow said good-bye to the spare brace she was at the end of her supplies and reached the rendezvous in time to turn her friends and since we are dealing in nightmares here are two more one genuine the other mercifully false there was a boat not only at but in the mouth of a river well home in german territory she was spotted and went under her commander perfectly aware that there was not more than five feet of water over her conning tower so that even a torpedo boat let alone a destroyer would hit it if she came over but nothing hit anything the search was conducted on scientific principles while they sat on the silt and suffered then the commander heard the rasp of a wire trawl sweeping over his hull it was not a nice sound but there happened to be a couple of gramophones aboard and he turned them both on to drown it and in due time that boat got home with everybody's hair of just the same colour as when they had started the other nightmare arose out of silence and imagination a boat had gone to bed on the bottom in a spot where she might reasonably expect to be looked for but it was a convenient jumping off or up place for the work at hand about the bad hour of two thirty a m the commander was waked by one of his men who whispered to him they've got the chains on us sir whether it was pure nightmare and hallucination of long wakefulness something relaxing and releasing in that packed box of machinery or the disgustful reality the commander could not tell but it had all the makings of panic in it so the lord and long training put it into his head to reply have they well we shan't be coming up till nine o'clock this morning we'll see about it then turn out that light please he did not sleep but the dreamer and the others did and when morning came and he gave the order to rise she rose unhampered and he saw the grey smeared seas from above once again he said it was a very refreshing sight lastly which is on all fours with the gamble of the chase a man was coming home rather bored after an uneventful trip it was necessary for him to sit on the bottom for a while and there he played patience of a sudden it struck him as a vow and an omen that if he worked out the next game correctly he would go up and strafe something the cards fell all in order he went up at once and found himself alongside a german whom as he had promised and prophesied to himself he destroyed she was a mine layer and needed only a jar to dissipate like a cracked electric light bulb he was somewhat impressed by the contrast between the single-handed game fifty feet below the ascent 
the attack the amazing result and when he descended again his cards just as he had left them the ships destroy us above and ensnare us beneath we arise we lie down and we move in the belly of death the ships have a thousand eyes to mark where we come and the mirth of a seaport dies when our blow gets home chapter two i was honoured by a glimpse into this veiled life in a boat which was merely practising between trips submarines are like cats they never tell who they were with last night and they sleep as much as they can if you board a submarine off duty you generally see a perspective of foreshortened fattish men laid all along the men say that except at certain times it is rather an easy life with relaxed regulations about smoking calculated to make a man put on flesh one requires well padded nerves many of the men do not appear on deck throughout the whole trip after all why should they if they don't want to they know that they are responsible in their department for their comrades lives as their comrades are responsible for theirs what's the use of flapping about better lay in some magazines and cigarettes when we set forth there had been some trouble in the fairway and a mind neutral whose misfortune all bore with exemplary calm was careened on a nearby shoal suppose there are more minds knocking about i suggested we'll hope there aren't was the soothing reply minds are all joss you either hit em or you don't and if you do they don't always go off they scrape alongside what's the etiquette then shut off both propellers and hope we were dodging various craft down the harbour when a squadron of trawlers came out on our beam at that extravagant rate of speed which unlimited government coal always leads to they were led by an ugly upstanding black-sided buccaneer with twelve pounders ah that's the king of the trawlers isn't he carrying dog too give him room one said we were all in the narrowed harbour mouth together there's my youngest daughter take a look at her someone hummed as a punctilious navy cap slid by on a very near bridge we'll fall in behind him they're going over to the neutral then they'll sweep by the by did you hear about one of the passengers in the neutral yesterday he was taken off of course by a destroyer and the only thing he said was twenty-five time i have insured but not this time hang it the trawlers lunged ahead toward the forlorn neutral our destroyer nipped past us with that high-shouldered terrier-like pouncing action of the newer boats and went ahead a tramp in ballast her propeller half out of the water threshed along through the sallow haze lord what a shot somebody said enviously the men on the little deck looked across at the slow-moving silhouette one of them a cigarette behind his ear smiled at a companion then we went down not as they go when they are pressed the record i believe is fifty feet in fifty seconds from top to bottom but genteelly to an orchestra of appropriate sounds roarings and blowings and after the orders which come from the commander alone utter silence and peace there's the bottom we bumped at fifty fifty-two he said i didn't feel it we'll try again watch the gauge and you'll see it flick a little the practice of the art it may have been so but i was more interested in the faces and above all the eyes all down the length of her it was to them of course the simplest of manoeuvres they dropped into gear as no machine could but the training of years and the experience of the year leaped up behind those steady eyes under the electrics in the shadow of the tall motors between the pipes and the curved hull or glued to their special gauges one forgot the bodies altogether but one will never forget the eyes or the ennobled faces one man i remember in particular on deck his was no more than a grave rather striking countenance cast in the unmistakable petty officer's mould below as i saw him in profile handling a vital control he looked like the doge of venice 
the prior of some sternly ruled monastic order an old-time pope anything that signifies trained and stored intellectual power utterly and aesthetically devoted to some vast impersonal end and so with a much younger man who changed into such a monk as frank dixie used to draw only a couple of torpedo men not being in gear for the moment read an illustrated paper their time did not come till we went up and got to business which meant firing at our destroyer and i think keeping out of the light of a friend's torpedoes the attack and everything connected with it is solely the commander's affair he is the only one who gets any fun at all since he is the eye the brain and the hand of the whole this single figure at the periscope the second in command heaves sighs and prays that the dummy torpedo there is less trouble about the live ones will go off all right or he'll be told about it the others wait and follow the quick run of orders it is if not a convention a fairly established custom that the commander shall inferentially give his world some idea of what is going on at least i only heard of one man who says nothing whatever and doesn't even wriggle his shoulders when he is on the sight the others soliloquize etc according to their temperament and the periscope is as revealing as golf submarines nowadays are expected to look out for themselves more than at the old practices when the destroyers walked circumspectly we dived and circulated under water for a while and then rose for a sight something like this up a little up up still where the deuce has he got to ah half a dozen orders as to helm and depth of descent and a pause broken by a drumming noise somewhere above which increases and passes away oh that's better up again this refers to the periscope yes ah no we don't think all right keep her down damn it mm, that ought to be nineteen knots dirty trick he's changing speed no he isn't he's all right ready forward there a valve sputters and drips the torpedo men crouch over their tubes and nod to themselves their faces have changed now he hasn't spotted us yet we'll just more helm and depth orders but especially helm wish we were working a beam tube never mind up a last string of orders six hundred and he doesn't see us fire the dummy left the second in command cocked one ear and looked relieved up we rose the wet air and spray spattered through the hatch the destroyer swung off to retrieve the dummy careless brutes destroyers are said one officer that fellow nearly walked over us just now did you notice the commander was playing his game out over again stroke by stroke with a beam tube i'd a strafed him amidship he concluded why didn't you then i asked there were loads of shiny reasons which reminded me that we were at war and cleared for action and that the interlude had been merely play a companion rose alongside and wanted to know whether we had seen anything of her dummy no but we heard it was the short answer i was rather annoyed because i had seen that particular daughter of destruction on the stocks only a short time ago and here she was grown up and talking about her missing children in the harbour again one found more submarines all patterns and makes and sizes with rumours of yet more and larger to follow naturally their men said we were only at the beginning of the submarine we shall have them presently for all purposes the man and the work now here is a mystery of the service a man gets a boat which for two years becomes his very self his morning hope his evening dream his joy throughout the day with him is a second in command an engineer and some others they prove each other's souls habitually every few days by the direct test of peril till they act think and endure as a unit in and with the boat that commander is transferred to another boat he tries to take with him if he can which he can't as many of his other selves as possible 
he is pitched into a new type twice the size of the old one with three times as many gadgets an unexplored temperament and unknown leanings after his first trip he comes back clamouring for the head of her constructor of his own second in command his engineer his cox and a few other ratings they for their part wish him dead on the beach because last commission with so-and-so nothing ever went wrong anywhere a fortnight later you can remind the commander of what he said and he will deny every word of it she's not he says so very vile things considered barring her five-ton torpedo derricks the abominations of her wireless and the tropical temperature of her beer lockers all of which signifies that the new boat has found her soul and her commander would not change her for battle cruisers therefore that he may remember he is the service and not a branch of it he is after certain seasons shifted to a battle cruiser where he lives in a blaze of admirals and aiguillettes responsible for vast decks and crypt-like flats a student of extended above-water tactics thinking in tens of thousands of yards instead of his modest but deadly three to twelve hundred and the man who takes his place straightway forgets that he ever looked down on great rollers from a sixty-foot bridge under the whole breadth of heaven but crawls and climbs and dives through conning towers with those same waves wet in his neck and when the cruisers pass him tearing the deep open in half a gale thanks god he is not as they are and goes to bed beneath their distracted keels expert opinions but submarine work is cold-blooded business this was at a little session in a green-curtained wardroom cum owner's cabin then there's no truth in the yarn that you can feel when the torpedo's going to get home i asked not a word you sometimes see it get home or miss as the case may be of course it's never your fault if it misses it's all your second in command that's true too said the second i catch it all round that's what i am here for and what about the third man there was one aboard at the time he generally comes from a smaller boat to pick up real work if he can suppress his intellect and doesn't talk last commission the third hand promptly denied the possession of any intellect and was quite dumb about his last boat and the men oh they train on too they train each other yes one gets to know em about as well as they get to know us up topside a man can take you in take himself in for months for half a commission perhaps down below he can't it's all in cold blood not like at the front where they have something exciting all the time then bumping mines isn't exciting oh not one little bit you can't bump back at em even with a zep oh now and then one interrupted and they laughed as they explained yes that was rather funny one of our boats came up slap underneath a low zep looked for the sky you know and couldn't see anything except this fat shining belly almost on top of em luckily it wasn't the zep stinging end so our boat went to windward and kept just a wash there was a bit of a sea and the zep had to work against the wind they don't like that our boat sent a man to the gun he was pretty well drowned of course but he hung on choking and spitting and held his breath and got in shots where he could this zepp was strafing bombs about for all she was worth and who was it mccartney i think potting at her between dives and naturally all hands wanted to look at the performance so about half the north sea flopped down below and oh they had a charlie chaplin time of it well somehow mccartney managed to rip the zepp a bit and she went to leeward with a list on her we saw her a fortnight later with a patch on her port side oh if fritz only fought clean this wouldn't be half a bad show but fritz can't fight clean and we can't do what he does even if we were allowed to one said no we can't tisn't done we have to fish fritz out of the water dry him and give him cocktails and send him to donnington hall and what does fritz do i asked he sputters and clicks and bows he has all the correct motions you know but of course when he's your prisoner you can't tell him what he really is and do you suppose fritz understands any of it i went on 
no or he wouldn't have lusitaniaed this war was his first chance of making his name and he chucked it all away for the sake of showing off as a foul gottstraffer and they talked of that hour of the night when submarines come to the top like mermaids to get and give information of boats whose business it is to fire as much and to splash about as aggressively as possible and of other boats who avoid any sort of display dumb boats watching and relieving watch with their periscope just showing like a crocodile's eye at the back of islands and the mouth of channels where something may some day move out in procession to its doom end of part two Part three of The Fringes of the Fleet by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three Patrols, Chapters One and Two. Be well assured that on our side our challenged oceans fight, though headlong wind and leaping tide make us their sport to night through force of weather not of war in jeopardy we steer then welcome fate's discourtesy whereby it shall appear how in all time of our distress as in our triumph too the game is more than the player of the game and the ship is more than the crew be well assured though wave and wind have mightier blows in store that we who keep the watch assigned must stand to it the more and as our streaming bows dismiss each billow's balked career sing welcome fate's discourtesy whereby it is made clear how in all times of our distress as in our triumph too the game is more than the player of the game and the ship is more than the crew be well assured though in our power is nothing left to give but time and place to meet the hour and leave to strive to live till these dissolve our order holes our service binds us here then welcome fate's discourtesy whereby it is made clear how in all times of our distress and our deliverance too the game is more than the player of the game and the ship is more than the crew chapter one on the edge of the north sea sits an admiral in charge of a stretch of coast without lights or marks along which the traffic moves much as usual in front of him there is nothing but the east wind the enemy and some few our ships behind him there are towns with m p s attached who a little while ago didn't see the reason for certain lighting orders when a zeppelin or two came they saw left and right of him are enormous docks with vast crowded sheds miles of stone-faced key edges loaded with all manner of supplies and crowded with mixed shipping in this exalted world one met staff captains staff commanders staff lieutenants and secretaries with paymasters so senior that they almost ranked with admirals there were warrant officers too who long ago gave up splashing about decks barefoot and now check and issue stores to the ravenous untruthful fleets said one of these guarding a collection of desirable things to a cross between a sick-bay attendant and a junior rider but he was really an expert burglar no and you can tell mr so-and-so with my compliments that the storekeeper's gone away right away with the key of these stores in his pocket understand me in his trousers pocket he snorted at my next question do i know any destroyer lieutenants said he this coast's rank with em destroyer lieutenants are born stealing it's a mercy they're too busy to practise forgery or i'd be in jail engineer commanders engineer lieutenants they're worse look here if my own mother was to come to me beggin brass screws for her own coffin i'd i'd think twice before i'd oblige the old lady war's war i grant you that but what i've got to contend with is crime i referred to him a case of conscience in which every one concerned acted exactly as he should and it nearly ended in murder 
during a lengthy action the working of a gun was hampered by some empty cartridge cases which the lieutenant in charge made signs no man could hear his neighbour speak just then should be hove overboard upon which the gunner rushed forward and made other signs that they were on charge and must be tallied and accounted for he too was trained in a strict school upon which the lieutenant but that he was busy would have slain the gunner for refusing orders in action afterwards he wanted him shot by court-martial but every one was voiceless by then and could only mouth and croak at each other till somebody laughed and the pedantic gunner was spared well that's what you might fairly call a naval crux said my friend among the stores the lieutenant was right mustn't refuse orders in action the gunner was right empty cases are on charge no one ought to chuck em away that way but damn it they were all of em right it ought to have been a marine then they could have killed him and preserved discipline at the same time a little theory the problem of this coast resolves itself into keeping touch with the enemy's movements in preparing matters to trap and hinder him when he moves and in so entertaining him that he shall not have time to draw clear before a blow descends on him from another quarter there are then three lines of defence the outer the inner and the home waters the traffic and fishing are always with us the blackboard idea of it is always to have stronger forces more immediately available everywhere than those the enemy can send x german submarines draw a english destroyers then x calls x plus y to deal with a who in turn calls up b a scout and possibly a squared with a fair chance that if x plus y plus z a zeppelin carry on they will run into a squared plus b squared plus c cruisers at this point the equation generally stops if it continued it would end mathematically in the whole of the german fleet coming out then another factor which we may call the grand fleet would come from another place to change the comparisons the grand fleet is the strong left ready to give the knockout blow on the point of the chin when the head is thrown up the other fleets and other arrangements threaten the enemy's solar plexus and stomach somewhere in relation to the grand fleet lies the blockading cordon which examines neutral traffic it could be drawn as tight as a turkish bowstring but for reasons which we may arrive at after the war it does not seem to have been so drawn up to date the enemy lies behind his mines and ours raids our coasts when he sees a chance and kills sea-going civilians at sight or guess with intent to terrify most sailor men are mixed up with a woman or two a fair percentage of them have seen men drown they can realize what it is when women go down choking in horrible tangles and heavings of draperies to say that the enemy has cut himself from the fellowship of all who use the seas is rather understating the case as a man observed thoughtfully you can't look at any water now without seeing lusitania sprawlin all across it and just think of those words north german lloyd hamburg america and such things in the time to come they simply mustn't be he was an elderly trawler respectable as they make them who after many years of fishing had discovered his real vocation i never thought i liked killin men he reflected never seemed to be any of my duty but it is and i do a great deal of the east coast work concerns minefields ours and the enemy's both of which shift as occasion requires we search for and root out the enemy's mines they do the like by us it is a perpetual game of finding springing and laying traps on the least as well as the most likely runaways that ships use such sea snaring and wiring as the world never dreamt of we are hampered in this because our navy respects neutrals and spends a great deal of its time in making their path safe for them the enemy does not he blows them up because that cows and impresses them and so adds to his prestige death and the destroyer 
the easiest way of finding a minefield is to steam into it on the edge of night for choice with a steep sea running for that brings the bows down like a chopper on the detonating horns some boats have enjoyed this experience and still live there was one destroyer and there may have been others since who came through twenty-four hours of highly compressed life she had an idea that there was a minefield somewhere about and left her companions behind while she explored the weather was dead calm and she walked delicately she saw one scandinavian steamer blow up a couple of miles away rescued the skipper and some hands saw another neutral which she could not reach till all was over skied in another direction and between her life-saving efforts and her natural curiosity got herself as thoroughly mixed up with the field as a camel among tent ropes a destroyer's bows are very fine and her sides are very straight this causes her to cleave the wave with the minimum of disturbance and this boat had no desire to cleave anything else none the less from time to time she heard a mine grate or tinkle or jar i could not arrive at the precise note it strikes but they say it is unpleasant on her plates sometimes she would be free of them for a long while and began to hope she was clear at other times they were numerous but when at last she seems to have worried out of the danger zone lieutenant and sub together left the bridge for a cup of tea in those days we took mines very seriously you know as they were in act to drink they heard the hateful sound again just outside the wardroom both put their cups down with extreme care little fingers extended we felt as if they might blow up too and tiptoed on deck where they met the forecastle also on tiptoe they pulled themselves together and asked severely what the forecastle thought it was doing beg pardon sir but there's another of those blighters tap tapping alongside our end they all waited and listened to their common coffin being nailed by death himself but the things bumped away at this point they thought it only decent to invite the rescued skipper warm and blanketed in one of their bunks to step up and do any further perishing in the open no thank you said he last time i was blown up in my bunk too that was all right so i think now too i stay in my bunk here it is cold upstairs somehow or other they got out of the mess after all yes we used to take mines awfully seriously in those days one comfort is fritz'll take them seriously when he comes out fritz don't like mines who does i wanted to know if you'd been here a little while ago you'd seen a commander coming in with a big un slung under his counter he brought the beastly thing in to analyze the rest of his squadron followed at two knot intervals and everything in harbour that had steam up scattered the admirable commander presently i had the honour to meet a lieutenant commander admiral who had retired from the service but like others had turned out again at the first flash of the guns and now commands he who had great ships erupting at his least signal a squadron of trawlers for the protection of the dogger bank fleet at present prices let alone the chance of the paying submarine men would fish in much warmer places his flagship is a multi-millionaire's private yacht in her mixture of stark carpetless curtainless carbolized present with voluptuously curved broad-decked easy stairwayed past she might be queen guinevere in the convent at amesbury and her lieutenant commander most careful to pay all due compliments to admirals who were midshipmen when he was a commander leads a congregation of very hard men indeed they do precisely what he tells them to do and with him go through strange experiences because they love him and because his language is volcanic and wonderful what you might call popocatalic polycalyptic i saw the old navy making ready to lead out the new under a grey sky and a falling glass the wisdom and cunning of the old man backed up by the passion and power of the younger breed and the discipline which had been his soul for half a century binding them all what'll he do this time i asked of one who might know he'll cruise between two and three east but if you'll tell me what he won't do it would be more to the point he's mine-hunting i expect just now 
wasted material here is a digression suggested by the sight of a man i had known in other scenes dispatch riding round a fleet in a petrol launch there are many of his type yachtsmen of sorts accustomed to take chances who do not hold master certificates and cannot be given sea-going commands like my friend they do general utility often in their own boats this is a waste of good material nobody wants amateur navigators the traffic lanes are none too wide as it is but these gentlemen ought to be distributed among the trawler fleet as strictly combatant officers a trawler skipper may be an excellent seaman but slow with a submarine shelling and diving or in cutting out enemy trawlers the young ones who can master q f work in a very short time would though there might be friction a court-martial or two and probably losses at first pay for their keep even a hundred or so of amateurs more or less controlled by their squadron commanders would make a happy beginning and i am sure they would all be extremely grateful where the east wind is brewed fresh and fresh every morning and the balmy night breeze blows straight from the pole i heard a destroyer sing what an enjoyable life does one lead on the north sea patrol to blow things to bits is our business and fritz's which means there are minefields where'er you stroll unless your particular wish to die quick you'll avoid steering close to the north sea patrol we warn from disaster the mercantile master who takes in high dudgeon our life-saving role for every one's grousing at docking and dousing the marks and the lights on the north sea patrol twelve verses omitted so swept but surviving half drowned but still driving i watched her head out through the swell of the shoal and i heard her propellers roar right to poor fellers who run such a hell as the north sea patrol chapter two the great basins were crammed with craft of kinds never known before on any navy list some were as they were born others had been converted and a multitude have been designed for special cases the navy prepares against all contingencies by land sea and air it was a relief to meet a batch of comprehensible destroyers and to drop again into the little mousetrap wardrooms which are as large-hearted as all our oceans the men one used to know as destroyer lieutenants born stealing are serious commanders and captains to-day but their sons lieutenants in command and lieutenant commanders do follow them the sea in peace is a hard life war only sketches an extra line or two round the young mouths the routine of ships always ready for action is so part of the blood now that no one notices anything except the absence of formality and of the crimes of peace what warrant officers used to say at length is cut down to a grunt what sailor men did not know and expected to have told him does not exist he has done it all too often at sea and ashore i watched a little party working under a leading hand at a job which eighteen months ago would have required a gunner in charge it was comic to see his orders trying to overtake the execution of them ratings coming aboard carried themselves with a to me new swing not swank but consciousness of adequacy the high dark forecastles which thank goodness are only washed twice a week received them and their bags and they turned to on the instant as a man picks up his life at home like the submarine crew they come to be a breed apart double-jointed extra-toed with brazen bowels and no sort of nerves it is the same in the engine-room when the ships come in for their regular looking over those who love them which you would never guess from the language know exactly what they need and get it without fuss everything that steams has her individual peculiarity and the great thing is at overhaul to keep to it and not develop a new one if for example through some trick of her screws not synchronizing a destroyer always casts to port when she goes astern do not let any zealous soul try to make her run true or you will have to learn her helm all over again and it is vital that you should know exactly what your ship is going to do three seconds before she does it similarly with men 
if any one from lieutenant commander to stoker changes his personal trick or habit even the manner in which he clutches his chin or caresses his nose at a crisis the matter must be carefully considered in this world where each is trustee for his neighbour's life and vastly more important the corporate honour what are the destroyers doing just now i asked oh running about much the same as usual the navy hasn't the least objection to telling one everything that it is doing unfortunately it speaks its own language which is incomprehensible to the civilian but you will find it all in the channel pilot and the riddle of the sands it is a foul coast hairy with currents and rips and mottled with shoals and rocks practically the same men hold on here in the same ships with much the same crews for months and months a most senior officer told me that they were good boys on reflection quite good boys but neither he nor the flags on his chart explained how they managed their lightless unmarked navigations through black night blinding rain and the crazy rebounding north sea gales they themselves ascribe it to joss that they have not piled up their ships a hundred times i expect it must be because we're always dodging about over the same ground one gets to smell it we've bumped pretty hard of course but we haven't expended much up to date you never know your luck on patrol though the nature of the beast personally though they have been true friends to me i loathe destroyers and all the raw racking ricocheting life that goes with them the smell of the wet lammies and damp wardroom cushions the galley chimney smoking out the bridge the obstacle-strewn deck and the pervading beastliness of oil grit and greasy iron even at moorings they shiver and sidle like half-backed horses at sea they will neither rise up and fly clear like the hydroplanes nor dive and be done with it like the submarines but imitate the vices of both a scientist of the lower deck describes them as half switchback half water shoot and hell continuous their only merit from a landsman's point of view is that they can crumple themselves up from stem to bridge and i have seen it still get home but one does not breathe these compliments to their commanders other destroyers may be they will point them out to you poisonous bags of tricks but their own command never is she high bowed that is the only type which overrides the seas instead of smothering is she low low bows glide through the water where those collier nosed brutes smash it open is she mucked up with submarine catchers they rather improve her trim no other ship has them have they been denied to her thank heaven we go to sea without a fish curing plant on deck does she roll even for her class she is drier than dreadnoughts is she permanently and infernally wet stiff sir stiff the first requisite of a gun platform service as requisite thus the caesars and their fortunes put out to sea with their subs and their sad-eyed engineers and their long-suffering signallers i do not even know the technical name of the sin which causes a man to be born a destroyer signal in this life and the little yellow shells stuck all about where they can be easiest reached the rest of their acts is written for the information of the proper authorities it reads like a page of todd hunter but the masters of merchant ships could tell more of eyeless shapes barely outlined on the foam of their own arrest who shout orders through the thick gloom alongside the strayed and anxious neutral knows them when their searchlights pin him across the deep or their sirens answer the last yelp of his as steam goes out of his torpedoed boilers they stand by to catch and soothe him in his pyjamas at the gangway collect his scattered lifeboats and see a warm drink into him before they turn to hunt the slayer the drifters punching and reeling up and down their ten-mile line of traps the outer trawlers drawing the very teeth of death with water-sodden fingers are grateful for their low guarded signals and when the zeppelin's revealing star-shell cracks darkness open above him the answering crack of the invincible destroyer's guns comforts the busy mine-layers 
big cruisers talk to them too and what is more they talk back to the cruisers sometimes they draw fire pinkish spurts of light a long way off where fritz is trying to coax them over a minefield he has just laid or they steal on fritz in the midst of his job and the horizon rings with barking which the inevitable neutral who saw it all reports as a heavy fleet action in the north sea the sea after dark can be as alive as the woods of summer nights everything is exactly where you don't expect it and the shyest creature are the farthest away from their holes things boom overhead like bitterns or scutter alongside like hares or arise dripping and hissing from below like otters it is the destroyer's business to find out what their business may be through all the long night and to help or hinder accordingly dawn sees them pitch-poling insanely between head-seas or hanging on to bridges that sweep like sighs from one forlorn horizon to the other a homeward-bound submarine chooses this hour to rise very ostentatiously and signals by hand to a lieutenant in command they were the same term at dartmouth and same first ship what's he saying secure that gun will you can't hear oneself speak the gun is a bit noisy on its cone but that isn't the reason for the destroyer lieutenant's short temper says he's going down sir the signaller replies what the submarine had spelt out and everybody knows it was cannot approve of this extremely frightful weather am going to bye-bye well snaps the lieutenant to his signaller what are you grinning at the submarine has hung on to ask if the destroyer will kiss her and whisper good night a breaking sea smacks her tower in the middle of the insult she closes like an oyster but just too late ha bet there must be a quarter of a ton of water somewhere down below on its way to her ticklish batteries what a wag says the signaller dreamily well he can't say he didn't get a little kiss the lieutenant in command smiles the sea is a beast but a just beast racial untruths this is trivial enough but what would you have if admirals will not strike the proper attitudes nor lieutenants emit the appropriate sentiments one is forced back on the truth which is that the men at the heart of great matters in our empire are mostly of an even simplicity from the advertising point of view they are stupid but the breed has always been stupid in this department it may be due as our enemies assert to our racial snobbery or as others hold to a certain god-given lack of imagination which saves us from being over-concerned at the effects of our appearance on others either way it deceives the enemy's people more than any calculated lie when you come to think of it though the english are the worst paperwork and viva voce liars in the world they have been rigorously trained since their early youth to live and act lies for the comfort of the society in which they move and so for their own comfort the result in this war is interesting it is no lie that at the present moment we hold all the seas in the hollow of our hands for that reason we shuffle over them shamefaced and apologetic making arrangements here and flagrant compromises there in order to give substance to the lie that we have dropped fortuitously into this high seat and are looking round the world for some one to resign it to nor is it any lie that had we used the navy's bare fist instead of its gloved hand from the beginning we would in all likelihood have shortened the war that being so we elected to dab and peck at and half strangle the enemy to let him go and choke him again it is no lie that we continue on our inexplicable path animated we will try to believe till other proof is given by a cloudy idea of alleviating or mitigating something for somebody not ourselves here of course is where our racial snobbery comes in which makes the german gibber i cannot understand why he has not accused us to our allies of having secret commercial understandings with him for that reason we shall finish the german eagle as the merciful lady killed the chicken it took her the whole afternoon and then you will remember the carcass had to be thrown away meanwhile there is a large and unlovely water inhabited by plain men in severe boats 
who endure cold exposure wet and monotony almost as heavy as their responsibilities charge them with heroism but that needs heroism indeed accuse them of patriotism they become ribald examine into the records of the miraculous work they have done and they are doing they will assist you but with perfect sincerity they will make as light of the valour and forethought shown as of the ends they have gained for mankind the service takes all work for granted it knew long ago that certain things would have to be done and it did its best to be ready for them when it disappeared over the skyline for manoeuvres it was practising always practising trying its men and stuff and throwing out what could not take the strain that is why when war came only a few names had to be changed and those chiefly for the sake of the body not of the spirit and the seniors who hold the key to our plans and know what will be done if things happen and what links wear thin in the many chains they are of one fibre and speech with the juniors and the lower deck and all the rest who come out of the undemonstrative households ashore here is the situation as it exists now say the seniors this is what we do to meet it look and count and measure and judge for yourself and then you will know it is a safe offer the civilian only sees that the sea is a vast place divided between wisdom and chance he only knows that the uttermost oceans have been swept clear and the trade routes purged one by one even as our armies were being convoyed along them that there was no island nor key left unsearched on any waters that might hide an enemy's craft between the arctic circle and the horn he only knows that less than a day's run to the eastward of where he stands the enemy's fleets have been held for a year and four months in order that civilization may go about its business on all our waters end of part three end of the fringes of the fleet by rudyard kipling